This is a preview of my Python backend course. If you'd be interested in this, check out the link down in the pinned comment or in the description. Hey everyone, Caleb here. So excited to see you join this course. This is going to be the start of a fabulous journey for you to learn backend development. So this is going to help you as a web developer, and I'm gonna to try to give you principles that can be applied to real world projects and help your career. But before we just jump in, there are a few things I wanted to talk about before we get started. The biggest thing is the way you follow these videos. So we have the visual, these videos, but we also have notes. And I think you should be going through these notes as you go through the videos, because we're gonna follow them pretty closely. This will give you two different ways of learning the material with your eyes and then also with your reading. And maybe these will help different parts of your brain to retain the information. On top of this though, you'll want to go through the exercises and follow along. This is your third way of learning the material. If you just watch the videos from beginning to end, you might have a better understanding of general web development, but you're not gonna be able to apply those principles to your projects. So follow the videos, the notes, and the code. That'll give you the best chance of learning this material and getting out of the end of this course with some skills that you can apply to your career. Now this course is primarily focused on the back end. The back end drives the functionality of websites and applications. Front end, on the other hand, is more focused on the visual aspect of websites and applications. Yes, there will be functionality built in, but the front end will most likely connect to the back end which will do the majority of the processing. So with backend development, you'll do things like create APIs or store information in databases. Now, although this is a backend course, we will get a tad bit of experience with frontend development as well. However, this course is not dedicated to frontend, so that material might just get you started in the right direction with the frontend, and as time goes on, you might need to adapt that material with whatever new framework is out. But I'll do my best to teach the material in a way that is lasting, if that makes sense. You know, we want to learn the material in a way that will help us for the next 10 years, not just learning the next new tool that might be obsolete in the next year or two. So we wanna leave this course having a better understanding of web development in general, so that you have skills to be able to pick up new things and be a better web developer in general. So that is the approach of all my teaching, and hopefully you can align yourself to that approach to where anything we're typing out, you try to make yourself understand why we're typing those things out. And if you don't understand, doing a little bit of extra research so that you do understand. Instead of just copying and pasting code, you want to understand why you're putting that code there so that you can take those same concepts and apply them to any programming language or any framework that you use in the future. Because a lot of these different languages and tools will have a lot in common. So if you start with Python web development and you end up moving to C-sharp or Node, well, a lot of these principles are going to stay the same. But if you just memorize and you don't really understand things, well, then you're gonna have to do that whole process over again whenever you switch to a new language or framework. So what does a web developer do? Well, you're primarily going to focus yourself with databases, web servers, and APIs. So you're going to take requests and do some data processing and give back a response. Modern web development utilizes many pieces that communicate with one another. So we will learn these different pieces and figure out how to put them all together. Now, just to be clear, there is a million different ways you could design an application. For example, the simplest might be a database, a backend, and a front end. Or instead, you might break each one of those up into even smaller pieces and develop your application in microservices, which you can think of a microservice as just a small piece of software designed to solve one purpose. And an application could consist of 10 or 20 or more microservices. So you might have a microservice for user authentication and a microservice for I'm out of ideas for the database layer and the API or a microservice that deals with processing payments. I think when starting out, it's simpler to not create too many different services and keep it pretty simple. And as you grow in your skill, you'll be able to break out different pieces into different projects and piece them together. But sometimes I think people over engineer an application and you have some really complex thing that changing one little piece requires you to figure out how everything's connected and update everything across all these different pieces. And all this separation of concerns is actually making things more complicated. So we'll start off with an application that has just a few different services, most likely the front end, back end, and the database. And as we go deeper into the course, we might introduce more 
smaller components that can do one specific thing. You know, say we wanted a service to send email or send text messages, we can introduce those. And we're going to be using AWS for the back end. So all of our servers and everything will be on AWS. And AWS works really well with this microservice mindset, as a lot of their different tools are broken up into these different pieces. So there is a dedicated service in AWS for email. And you often find whatever idea you have that you want to accomplish, well, AWS already has a dedicated thing for that. An example that we might run into pretty early on with this idea is when it comes to databases, you could have a database like SQLite, and this is a database where its file can be stored on the same web server that's taking requests and giving responses. This basically combines these two things, so now you have the backend web server and the database all in one component you can think of it as. Well, as your application grows, you might not really want that. And you want to split this out into its own database server and its own web server. This makes sense and is one of the first examples of when you might take a larger concept and split it up into smaller concepts and connect the two. And as you learn, you'll have a better feel of how to split up your application into multiple components. Now, we've already talked about one of the tools we're going to be using, AWS. But there's a lot more tools we're going to be needing for this course, so let's go through some of those and talk about what they're for. So the first one is Python. This is going to be the language of choice for what we're doing. Now, as I mentioned, don't over focus on what language, right? Because we want to focus on the principles that allow us to do web development. After you learn how to do this stuff in Python, you should be able to easily convert this over to something like Node.js or C Sharp or some other language. The next one which we mentioned is AWS. You will be needing an account on here, but there are many free tiers for this. So even if you don't want to be spending money on cloud services, you can still use AWS for a lot of things. Next up, we have Git, which you can find at git-scm.com. And this is a source control management software to organize and save our code in what's known as a repository. So we're going to be showing you how to do everything you need in Git and GitHub as well. So GitHub is the other tool, which will allow us to store our repositories online. So this is GitHub. We will be looking into this as well. And we'll be showing this as we go through the course. So don't feel like you have to do all of this ahead of time. Another big tool we're going to be using is pip, which is how we install stuff from the Python package index. So this will allow us to introduce code that's already been written and use it in our project, which makes things a lot easier. We may also use Postman, which allows us to test APIs. However, Django, the Python web development framework we're going to be using, also has some built-in capabilities for testing APIs. So we may not need Postman, but it's always a good tool to get some experience with. One of the good benefits is it allows you to save different queries so you can keep track of the different API endpoints and have it all organized. So that's a big summary of the main tools we're going to be using for this course. But let's go in a little bit more detail. And I'm sure there might be some other tools that we run into as we go through. I'm just talking about the main ones in this video so you have an idea of what we'll be covering. First off, let's talk about pip. Pip can be used to install any package. So for example, you can look up a package like requests, which is used to make requests to websites through Python, and you can issue pip install requests. Another one that you might want to know about is Boto3, which can be used to connect to different services in AWS. Here we go. Any package you install, we can basically keep track of that in a requirements.txt file, which can be used to download all the packages needed for our application. So we'll show you how to do that. Now on AWS, there's a bunch of different tools that you should become familiar with inside of their platform. So if you hover over products, you can see some previews. The big one under compute is EC2, and this will allow us to have a server that we can install software on and on applications. Now under storage is another popular one we're going to need which is S3, Amazon Simple Storage Service. This will allow us to store things on the internet such as images or other static files. Now back under compute you can see AWS Elastic Beanstalk. This is a simple way to deploy and run applications. It's basically an abstraction on top of AWS EC2 and S3. So we will be using this to deploy our software. Another cool tool is under probably developer tools. And you can see AWS Code Pipeline, which is for continuous delivery to AWS. So this can be really handy if you want to, say, have a certain branch in GitHub automatically deploy your software. This is going down the path of DevOps, but it's good to know a little bit about it when you are a developer. Now under database, 
you can see there's a lot of different options. A big database in AWS is Amazon DynamoDB. That's their NoSQL database. But you can also use typical databases you might be familiar with already, such as relational databases, Postgres. So you can see there's a lot of different options there. Back under Compute, there's AWS Lambda. So this is known as serverless, and a lot of the different tools we've talked about are serverless. This can initially be confusing because it makes it sound like it doesn't use servers but it doesn't really work that way. It will use servers, but the whole idea is that you as a developer don't touch the servers or have any idea about the servers. It's all abstracted away to make it very easy to focus on development as opposed to the hardware that the software is running on. So instead of getting charged this much per month, you'll get charged per execution and you don't have to worry about hitting the limit of what that computer can handle because a lot of these will auto scale to the demands of your software. So that is a quick overview of AWS and the different tools we're gonna to be taking a look at in this course. There's so many different things in AWS, the possibilities are endless. That's why I really prefer AWS because everything I might need, they seem to have. Of course, you could use Azure or Google Cloud Platform or any of these other cloud platforms out there, but I just prefer AWS, it's what I'm most familiar with, and they always have what I need. I just think the overall experience is pretty good. But let me know for sure if you do decide to use some of these other cloud platforms, if you run into any issues or any notes for other people using these platforms, that would be really handy to share with me. So drop that down in a comment below or send me an email, whatever you need to do to share that information. Now, a little bit of extra information about Git. It is known as source control whenever you put your code in some kind of repository, basically a way to keep track of code changes. And Git is specifically known as a decentralized source control management system. This means we are not required to upload our commits, our changes to a centralized server, and we can have the entire repository local on our computer. And anybody who clones that repository is going to have the full ability to run that as their own host for that repository, which saying that can be a little bit confusing until we actually go through some examples. But when you use a tool like GitHub, you're basically using GitHub as a centralized place to send the code to, but you're not required to do that. You can use Git just on your local computer and get some of the different features of Git and you can share it peer to peer. So you take that repository and give it to somebody on a flash drive. It's not required to be on some centralized server like AWS or GitHub or any of these other locations. This gives you a lot of more capabilities and it also makes the repository very resilient. Say you get your GitHub account hacked and the repository is deleted. Well, you'll have that entire repository on your local machine. So it's very difficult to destroy the entire repository. Now that's worst case scenario. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but we don't have a centralized location that could be a single point of failure. One of the big benefits of this is it allows you to make multiple commits locally without pushing those changes to a centralized location like GitHub. This allows you to make sure your code is up to par before you push those changes. So maybe you're working on something that's a little bit bigger and you just make multiple commits and then once you're done with five commits, you push all of those to GitHub. That's another thing you can do that a lot of the centralized repository systems don't do. Plus Git has pretty much become the industry standard for source control management at the time of this recording. So I think that would be the recommended tool. And if you're on something like Subversion or that's what you're more familiar with, I'd recommend becoming familiar with Git and GitHub probably. Now GitHub is not associated with Git directly. They are just one of the providers out there for hosting for your repository, but they introduce features that make the coding experience better, such as pull requests. This will allow changes in your code to be reviewed before merging them into the main software. This is probably one of the most important parts of real world software development. You need a good system for working with multiple people and releasing software. Now, a quick note about source control, not everything should go in source control. Well, you don't have to store the dependency files in source control. You can just say which dependencies you need and anybody who's working with your project can just pull all those from the Python package index. So basically anything you don't wanna go inside a repository, you can make a list of those in what's known as a git ignore file. And this is going to look through your projects and anything that's not in that file to go into the repository 
but anything that you say, hey, I'm not interested in putting this in the repository, it'll skip those. Now, if you're brand new to this, don't worry, we're gonna go through all of it. I'm just trying to give a good overview. And if you're an expert at this, well, just be patient as we try to explain each step of the software development cycle. GitHub allows for free, private, and public repositories, so there shouldn't be any money involved. So even if you're not working in a team environment, my suggestion is to use at least a private repository just to save your code. If your laptop or desktop gets stolen or stops working, you have everything backed up because there's going to be a point when you don't do that and you're going to wish you did. You know, there were projects I was working on in college that I didn't put up in source control and I wish I did because I wanted to see those projects now. So I now try to store everything up there and even if I don't want it public, I'll make it private and I can keep that for my future use. All right, so that is our high level overview and introduction to the various tools we're gonna to be looking at in this course. And now we can move on a little bit to the software architecture and what we plan on doing with that. So stay tuned for the next episode and hopefully this one was a good intro, but next one we're gonna get a little bit deeper.